We're all about health this afternoon, and health and individual responsibility goes hand in hand. And this is why TAP has put together an important, their focus on four areas, cardiovascular health, primary eye care, finance, and, and sorry, and, and, and orthopedic, or the area of orthopedic medicine. So without any further ado, I think we should really focus on the mo these are the most important areas. We are very grateful to have the, the experience, Dr. Ronald Henry. Dr. Henry has, a, a, what you just mentioned cardiovascular disease, and it is a name that he it is the most renowned in, um, and distinguished practitioner in the country. So what you have here this afternoon, you have the top of the line, the best. I don't need to go into all of his professional qualifications. He's been trained at UWI in Jamaica and a, a number of places and certified a number of institutions in the United States. With all of that, Dr. Henry, we are grateful to have you, you spend a couple of half an hour or whatever time with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Master Ceremonies, colleagues, friends. Um, Similar age, most of us. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm Ronald Henry. I've been uh, around in cardiology for a while and cardiovascular disease. And um, first of all, let me, let, me, let me apologize for the late start. Uh, I was, um, I guess I was told Mahoya, but somehow I heard La Hoya. So, so anyway, La Jolla sends the greetings as well. <laughs> so, so here we are. Um, they, they say your health is your wealth. But um, I don't think we understand how true that is until it fails us. You know, when it's there, we take it for granted. And um, you're going along and you say, well, it's a nice talk. Health is a wealth. It's got a little pizzazz to it. But until, until because of our health, we are no longer able to earn a revenue. Because of our health, we keep paying out, whether it is full pay or copy, and can't bring anything in because it's our, our, our because of in trying to get our health back, we end up spending for expensive operations and expensive medications. We, we, it's only then we see that the money saved is being challenged and not going in the direction that we wanted to go in. Now, and that's why the cheapest way to treat with those diseases is to prevent the big spend, to try to prevent the disease from happening. Now, as uh, I'm sure, there's no time like the present to start, and so I want to re-emphasize to you that even if you had not been doing the right things all along, it's never too late to start. And that's the, that's the first thing. <clears throat> now, of the many things you could do to prevent heart disease from happening, there are few things that will both help you and put money in your pocket at the same time. And the Best, the biggest thing to both help you prevent you from getting heart disease and put money in your pocket is to stop smoking. The moment you stop smoking, your pocket starts growing. And, and, and that is the, I don't know much about financial health. Somebody's going to come here who knows about financial health and tell you about that. But here's what I know. <laughs> I know that stopping smoking will put money in your pocket. So, so, this, so this, is a, this is something that is universal. But not only is that so, 
I want you, many of us who don't smoke, live in houses with people who smoke. No, I ain't breaking up nothing. I just, I'm not, I'm not saying to start no fight. I'm not saying to look for somebody who don't smoke. But I am saying it's very reasonable if there's a caring relationship if there's a household of people who care for one another, that one could and should ask the smoker, say, here now, when you're doing that, do it outside. And, and there is no reason to not do it outside. Even if a person is challenged, and, they, and they, whether it's a son, whether it's a wife, whether it's an uncle or a grandfather, well, you know, pops, if you're strong enough to smoke that, we organize a door that you could walk outside and do it. Because it's not just the person who smokes. It's also the secondhand smoke. It's the, it's the smoke that lingers in the atmosphere. People sometimes wonder, if we're making too big a deal about secondhand smoke. Well, let me tell you what we now know. What we now know is that even the smoke and the smog and the particle matter from the traffic jam you had coming inside here, over time adds up. In other words, the pollution in the atmosphere we know of good data also contributes to heart disease. So if that is so, and that is just from the stuff that is out there in the atmosphere, how much so from the smoke that is trapped inside the house? So there's really no reason. Even we'd like to think about the good old days. Remind, remember the good old days. Wood fire inside of the tapir hut. Smoke, wood burning, in an enclosed environment, those things belong outside. When it's in there, in certain parts of India where that is still common, they have the highest incidence of heart disease. So it's been well shown, and, and I want you to take a stand. If there's love, I would love for you to go outside just more. Now, <clears throat> So that's the first take home, because it's cheap, generally puts money in your pocket. The second take home I want to leave you with is the issue of activity. I'm not sending you out to jog, to cause hard work for the next speaker who is coming up to speak. And I'm not saying that if you've never exercised, that you should go out and try to become an aerobic or enthusiast or start a pump iron over age 60. But here's what I am saying. I am saying that once you could walk about the house, you need to set as your goal walking for half an hour, five days a week. Half an hour, five days a week. Better in the morning than in the evening, but whenever you could make it, make it. It's half an hour, five days a week. Now, what does that do for you? Many people focus on their weight. And many people start an exercise program and then they get into it, they're feeling good. The more they do it, they go a little faster. They start over three days a week, get up to five days a week. Next thing you know, they find the breaking a sweat. They say, yes, I'm going good. Then they get on the scale, and the scale they move. 
So they said, all right, they go back out, they do it again, they kept going. People started to tell them, yeah, hey, you're looking good, girl. Ah, you're looking waist down, this, that, that. But they get on the scale and it only gone down by one pound or half a kilo. Or... So, well, so many people get frustrated that they then stop exercising. Well, if this is you, has this ever happened to anybody here? Where you're exercising and you don't see any weight going, you say, well, what, man? Well, let me tell you, a lot is happening. Because whether you see the scale dropping or not, the destination is in the journey. In other words, 70% of the benefit of exercise comes not from the weight loss that you see on the poundage, 70% of the benefit comes from just doing it. You change your metabolism. You hear about the good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. The good cholesterol doesn't start going up. The bad cholesterol starts going down. You hear about the metabolism changing. That starts changing. The reason people are looking at you and telling you you're looking good is because they're seeing the belly fat starting to go, even if muscle coming up somewhere else. Lose the fascination with the numbers on the scale. When they come down, they come down. When they don't come down, they don't come down. It doesn't matter. You are still getting the benefit. Furthermore, of all the fancy treatments there are, and there are many, and many of them expensive, to prevent Alzheimer's, few of them do more than exercise. Exercise is as good a treatment at preventing or slowing down what they call minimal cognitive impairment. That means I'm losing my memory, I can't do things, things that all of us know about, right? But it's going a little faster in some than others. Exercise. No, exercise will not put money in your pocket like stopping smoking. In fact, exercise might cost you a pair of sneakers once a year. So it's not entirely free, but it's the closest thing you could get to it. And you don't have to be going fast. It is important that you at least walk half an hour and you do it five days a week. And carry the grandchild with you. Carry, because there's nothing like developing, not just the camaraderie, not just the shared experience, but you're training them, you're putting in the head somewhere in the back here that they're going to be physically active. They're going to leave the smartphone and the tablet and the thing behind and engage in a physical activity. So that's the second thing. And the third thing I want to leave with you is the idea that there are a number of items of fake news going around. A lot of people come, they try their best, but they end up, because we have information, it's an information day and age, people can get into, get on the internet and get all kinds of information. It's hard to tell what is right and what is wrong, especially everything looking so right. And, and I, ain't talking about, I ain't talking about US politics here. One of the big things you will see when you go on the internet or when you hear a lot of alleged gurus talking is the wonderful benefits of coconut oil. Nobody talks about it in medicine because it's so it becomes suddenly so controversial. Huh? And the, everything from Alzheimer's to belly fat to if you drink coconut oil, you'll get handsome and you will this, that. And there are many good things to be said about coconut oil. But I want to leave you with this. 
if you have heart disease and or if your cholesterol level is high which means that you are at risk for heart disease coconut oil is not for you I want to make that clean and clear. I know plenty of people here are going to be vexed with me for saying so, but I can't help it. My mother bring me up to tell the truth. God bless her. Coconut oil, yes, raises your good cholesterol, but it also raises your bad cholesterol. I want to tell you, it's good for a lot of things, you know. When you see starving little kids with a bone showing and thing, and the undernourished. One of the greatest wonder foods you could give them is coconut oil. They strengthen up the, you know. Last night I drove in to my house late in the night and my wife was with me and she said, the dog's looking nice, eh? I said, yeah, man, I find it looking healthy and good. She said, good. I'll get them a teaspoon of coconut oil in the food. And I'm sure the coats are shiny. They look nice. It does a lot of wonderful things. But a treatment that is right for undernutrition is unlikely to be right for overnutrition. And cholesterol dominated heart disease is a condition of overnutrition. I ain't saying you're eating too much, but I'm saying there's more going in than coming out. And coconut oil is the most saturated fat on the planet. Somewhere between 80 and 90, 98%, depending on which type you have, is saturated fat. Coconut oil has more saturated fat than butter, or lard, or bacon. No. True. If you eat butter, it will raise your cholesterol faster than coconut oil, because butter is an animal product. And animal products raise your cholesterol faster than plant products. So that is good. True. Coconut oil, if you use extra virgin, if you use cold press, has lower saturated fat than traditional produced coconut oil. But what is the difference? You're talking between something that over 90% saturated fat to something that is 82% or 88% saturated fat is still the most saturated fat on the planet. So, people, the coconut oil that you have at home, give it to the person who underweight and not putting on, the person who they used to call magabone, the person who, person who is not eating enough, the person, huh? And the people who are well nourished, who are, might be diabetic, who might have heart disease, keep it away from them. If, if, you, if you remember nothing else that I tell you today, I beg you, please remember that. And there's one more thing I would like to tell you. And I would say because there's we could talk about heart disease for a long time. I would prefer to spend any more time answering any questions you have. So by all means, um, to the extent that there's time, I'd like to encourage you to do so. So the one thing I want to, the last thing I want to share with you in terms of the things that you can do we talked about stopping smoking and discouraging smoking in the people in your house and sending them outside to smoke. We talked about exercise and encouraging your grandchildren to come walk with you so that they can develop the habit from early. We talked about the role of coconut oil. It's not whether it's good or bad. It is that who it is being taken it's good for some people, it's bad for others. And the people it's bad for are the people who are at risk of heart disease. And the last thing I want to make sure I tell you, because it is so commonly a problem in our society. People, 
and it is one of the biggest fake news. There's nothing, people, I guess a lot of people were scared by the earthquake. Because earthquake scares people. But it seems to me that earthquake, the fear that people have from the earthquake, is a joke to the fear people have from statins. You know, you have, it's the most amazing thing. People dropping down, boom, 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 right, left, and center from heart trouble. They're quite happy to take coconut oil because somebody said it will shrink the belly fat. Maybe it will. And nobody forget to tell you that it actually raises your, your bad cholesterol. But finally, you go to your doctor and he tells you, he says, listen, your father died from heart disease. Your mother have angina. Your sister had a stent. You don't have sugar. Your cholesterol going up. Listen, you need to bring the cholesterol level down and you need a drug called a statin. Now, of course, so the doctor says he's started and he writes a prescription for you. You could pay for it and get a fancy one. You could take the CDAP one and get it for free. Your choice. But of course, you mustn't trust the doctor. Go to the person who knows the best. That's the lady who lives over the fence, right? So you go on to the lady over the fence and you say, my doctor say, so you need a statin. What do you think? And she tell you how bad it is. She tell you how it go mash up your kidney, which is not true. Statins do not damage the kidney. They say it go mash up your liver. It is true that statins, if you keep taking higher and higher doses, there will come a dose where the blood test for your liver function will go up. But then all your doctor will do is cut back the dose and everything will come back down without any permanent damage. They will tell you, boy, you know Jamie get cancer from that. Statins do not cause cancer. I hear it has caused Alzheimer's. Statins, half of what people call Alzheimer's is something called vascular dementia. That means that cholesterol blocking up the artery in your head. And statins will help unclog that and prevent what looks like Alzheimer's. So I say to you, I spend a lot of my hours when I'm working in the hospital fixing and cleaning out people's arteries and the heart. But the, the general practitioner who across the corridor from me and writing prescriptions for statins is saving more lives than I am. And the time it will take me to clear out one artery, he done write a whole heap of prescriptions and save more lives than I have saved. Statins have saved more lives in this world than bypass surgery. I say to you people of Trinidad and Tobago, the heart attack capital of the Caribbean. By the way, do you know that Trinidad and Tobago, back in the, about 10 years ago, had the distinction of being, of having the highest mortality rate adjusted for age, the highest mortality rate for heart disease in the entire Americas, higher than United States, higher than Canada, higher. We, we, living in the, we have been living in the heart attack capital of the Americas. Now, we are no longer at the top of the heap of countries with heart attack, but we dropped the second. Would you like me to tell you who is now number one? 
Number one in the, all the Americas is now Guyana. So you are living just to be Trini and just to be alive and just to be an adult puts you in a high risk. In my estimation, the reason we have started to decrease is because those who can't afford the statins now could get it free. Those who can't afford the insulin could now get it free. Those who couldn't afford the pressure medicine could now get it free. And everything, everything you say is he, he pushing seed up. The answer is yes, because, because it is better to use the one you could get. They say if it can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. Right? The chairman just said must sing old time tunes, so I wouldn't sing it. I will leave it as a talk. So the point, the point I want to say though, is that lose the fear of the statins. They are your lifesavers. And how long should you take it for? You should take it for just as long as you plan to take your pressure medicine. How long should you take it for? You should take it for just as long as you plan to take your diabetes medicine. Because the reason you're taking a pressure medicine is to prevent heart disease. The reason you're taking a diabetes medicine is to prevent the complications of diabetes. And the most common cause of premature death in diabetes is heart disease. So that you're taking a diabetes medicine. Well, for heaven's sake, take your cholesterol medicine too. So with this, I would like to leave you with a few things that I hope you will take home, that you will be empowered. I'd like to leave myself available for any question that might be asked if there are a couple minutes and you, and you just want to raise your hand, I'll be happy to. And, and if not, then I would say thank you very much for your attention. Oh, there's one person. Uh, C2, uh, maybe. Oh, we have a mic here. Right, okay, great. So we have a mic coming up. You don't have to ask about something I talk. If there's anything you want to ask about heart disease, I'm quite happy, or hypertension, I'm quite happy to answer. Yes, ma'am. One quick question. Cod liver oil. Is there any dangers in taking that? I've been taking it all my life since I know myself, and I'm still taking it. And um, the last time I've been to a doctor, he said, change it from the normal one to the high strength. And I have been taking it almost all my life. Is there any dangers? So cod liver oil, just to tell you the question, cod liver oil. Cod liver oil is an important source of what are called omega-3 fatty acids. Now, these fatty acids, which is the oily the cod is which is ocean fish. Many ocean fish have, create, have oils. The oil that fish produce is a special type of oil. It's called omega-3 products. And yes, cod liver oil is great. Take cod liver oil. Um, you don't have to, you could use cod liver oil to get the omega-3. You could use, uh, they are, they are omega-3 products that sell as omega-3. I will tell you that, oh, or you could just eat fish. You know, we live on an island and have fish. You could eat fish and you will get the fish oil out of the fish. So whichever one you want. People who are, veg who are strict vegans and don't eat fish, you can get omega-3 from omega-3 capsules. If you're going to buy the omega-3 capsules for, your, for, for helping your heart, Please buy omega-3. Please do not buy 369. There are benefits to the 369, but, it, but for the heart, it's the 3. In fact, for the heart benefit, the 679 actually dilutes some of the effect. So if you want it for the heart benefit, it's 3. And, and if you don't want that and you're a vegan, you could get some omega-3 from flax seeds. So all of these are options, and they don't interfere with the statins. So do not stop your statin because you're taking omega-3. If, if your doctor prescribes a statin for you, it's because you need it. Yes, sir. 
Uh, doctor, my name is James Campbell. I'm 81 and counting. All right. All right. Um, you talked about uh, uh, what it was. Uh, it's all right. Don't show. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things I'd like to know, over the years, I haven't had uh, any medical problem. But as I'm getting older, it seems as though a lot of things is coming through now. Now, uh, a couple of years ago, I had uh, surgery. I lost a kidney. Yeah, I lost a kidney. Yeah, I, I'm with you. And... Um, from the doctor, I realized that uh, the kidney was dead within me for the longest while. I had no signs. I had no problems, health problems otherwise. And uh, I want to know if there is any signs that a person can uh, probably distinguish or, or realize during the course of time that uh, would probably cause you that kidney problem. All right. Another thing, another thing you spoke about Alzheimer's. Is there any local or ordinary signs that people within certain age, whether young or old, would realize or can understand that um, hey, something is going wrong, and I gotta look out for Alzheimer. I don't know or later in life. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Campbell asked about kidney disease and Alzheimer's. I'm going to answer that in the context of heart. Yeah, because there's a lot you could say about kidney disease, a lot you could say about, about Alzheimer's, but we we'll leave that for when those people are talking. What I'll say about kidney disease is remember, you could, if you have healthy kidneys, you could donate one, right? And um, to somebody who needs it and still live a normal life. So it's not the end of the world if you've lost one kidney. It's fine. You, you, you'll do well, provided you know why you lost it. Because if you, if you lost it because of something that is peculiar to that kidney, then fine. But if you lost it because of something that affects both, then not good. And in the context of what we're talking about now, high blood pressure destroys your kidneys. Keep your blood pressure down. And if you suffer with high blood pressure, for heaven's sake, get a blood pressure kit and maybe three times a week measure it yourself write it down get used to what it 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 is what's a normal blood pressure you want to see and when you're looking at these two figures the top and the bottom long time long time they used to we used to feel that the bottom figure was the one that was causing the damage well it's not it's the top figure that causing the damage we used to look at the bottom figure because the top figure was hard to follow. The top figure used to swing all over the place. And the bottom figure was kind of more steady. So it was an easier thing to remember. But it is not the more important thing. So measure your home blood pressure. Keep the top figure under 40 all the time. Forget this long time story about 100 plus your age. So. Mr. Campbell, you're 81. Your top figure of systolic pressure should not be 181. And anybody who tells you that is okay, that will mash up your next kidney. What you want is the same blood pressure as a grandson. You want the top figure to be under 140, and the lower the better, and work with your doctor to do that. And if your home blood pressures are the top figure saying more than 140, and when you go by your doctor, he says, well, what I'm seeing here is okay. Show him your figures and tell him, I need to get this under 140. So that's what I want you to do. Alzheimer's, it's, it's very, very difficult, very difficult to distinguish between Alzheimer's and something called vascular dementia, which is caused by many strokes. Half of the people who think they have Alzheimer's well, half of the people who have Alzheimer's don't think they have Alzheimer's. Half of the people who are, who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's don't have Alzheimer's. What they have is vascular dementia. They rarely have a cardiovascular problem. 
you hear them talking about a heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation. The most common irregularity in senior citizens is atrial fibrillation. A simple ECG will find it. If you have atrial fibrillation, the vast majority of people who have atrial fibrillation need to be on a blood thinner for life. And I'm not talking about aspirin, and I'm not talking about Plavix. Everybody knows about Plavix these days. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about either warfarin, which, yes, is rat poison, or I'm talking about the other two newer ones, which is Zarelto and products. These are the one and the three of them you need to be taking. And how long should you take it? For as long as you want to take your high blood pressure medicines. How long you should take it? For as long as you want to take your diabetes medicines. For, uh, I need to go on. In other words, as soon as you're ready for a stroke, you can stop taking it. There's one more, and then I'll give way to the, on the thing. Somebody here. Hi, good afternoon. Now that I'm hearing that coconut oil is high, right, it um, causes, can cause cholesterol, are there any uh, oils that have lower saturation? Great. So let me answer that by saying the, the two oils you should have in your kitchen are olive oil and canola oil. Huh? Olive oil and canola oil. I don't care what the brand is, and I don't care if it's virgin, extra virgin, that olive oil and canola oil. People, I'm gone. By the way, if you see anybody selling doubles, ask them if they could prepare it with canola oil instead of coconut oil and ask them if they could get you a single instead of a double so you decrease the carbs. And if you do that, you probably have a healthy doubles. So there can be such a thing as a healthy doubles, but there's no such thing as a healthy alu pie. Thank you very much. Yeah. Dr. Menzio. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. MC. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Henry, for a fantastic um, opening presentation. Um, I'd also like to, to thank Top, uh, particularly Michelle and Mailing, who have done a, a great job in putting on this, this expo. Um, this is the best I've seen um, in Trinidad since I've been back. Uh, it certainly looks like the United States. So thank you much, everybody. You did a fantastic job. I, um, as, as the MC was saying, you know, I'm a UWI graduate, and I, I lecture at the university. Um, my area really, um, subspecialty is hip and knee um, pathology, in particular osteoarthritis. Uh, but the talk today is not going to be osteoarthritis. Um, I'm, I'm going to speak about a, another condition, one that you could prevent, and one that is potentially as deadly as what Dr. Henry was speaking about. He's speaking about osteoporosis, and really what happens when, when one falls. I've been a little bit um, put on the, on the back foot because I thought we'd have an audiovisual presentation. So I presented, I had my slides, and unfortunately, I am not as articulate as, as Dr. Henry, so I can't ad lib, and I'll have to use this to, to help me along. So I ask you to, be, to bear with me, please. Be, before I start, by a show of hands, can um, I see how many people here have fallen down in the last year? Right, okay. How many people fell in the last six months? All right. How many people have fallen multiple times in the last year? A couple. So the, the, the point is we have a captive audience. We, we, we are falling down, and falling down is not really a, a good thing to happen. You know, it's an accidental you know, um, impact with, with, with the earth. But we have people that fall regularly, and it doesn't cause a problem. And we know them, they're babies. Babies fall, nobody has a problem, they cry, they get back up. The, the, the young adult falls, and, and when they fall, they, they also get back up. They, they don't sustain as many injuries as the older patient. When the older patient falls, it can be a catastrophe. You, you'd be familiar with an older patient falling, and, and where do they fall? They don't fall in here, generally speaking. They, they, they don't fall in any parks. They fall in their houses. And where in the house do they fall? The bedroom and the bathroom. Those are two very dangerous places to be as an older, older person. 
And when they fall, they get great difficulty getting back up. They, they fall flat on their face, generally speaking. If you and I fall, or, you know, you, you can, you'll fall in such a way that you can get yourself back up. But the older patient falls flat down, there's nobody to, 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 to call, and they can't get back up. Well, that is a, a, a terrible thing to happen, generally speaking. But what, what, what is worse than that is that they sustain injuries. And the injuries I'd like to talk to you about really are the musculoskeletal injuries, in particular the fractures. But before we do that, let me just talk about some statistics. It is said that about 10 to 15 percent of all accident and emergency admissions are due to falls. So those are patients presenting to the A&E department that require admission. That, that is about one-fifth of the patients who actually had come to the, the accident emergency apartment and are discharged. So, so the, to, it is sufficient to say that falling is a very common problem um, and, 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 and we have to do something to try to prevent it. What are the causes of admission? Well, the main causes are upper limb injuries, you fall, you sprain your wrist, you break your wrist, traumatic brain injuries. You know, sometimes you, you, you get actually a bleed within the brain. But again, the one I'm going to talk to you about here are really the hip fractures, which is what we want to chat about a little bit. Some more statistics. As we get older, our risk of falling increases. That's a fact. And as we approach 80 years old, as our last, last question from the audience, your risk is actually almost three times what you'll get as when you are 40 years old. So you, you are likely to, to fall. And when you fall, you are likely to stay in a, a fracture. So in, in the audience here, I'm seeing mostly women. And, and, and this is the, the group that sustains the fractures. But if men think they are they're, they're, they're somehow, um, somehow escape it, no, 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 they don't. Actually, as you get older, the risk of falling increases. As you get older, the risk of dying because of a fracture also increases. But worse for men, compared to females of the same age, your risk of dying is actually greater. So in other words, men fall as they get older, and they're more likely to die if they break their, their hips. So this, this, is, this is a problem. This is actually a public health problem, very similar to, to hypertension and, and, and diabetes. We're speaking about falls and, 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 and the fractures. For you to sustain a fracture, you have to have two things. One, it's just you should fall, and, we, and we're going to talk about preventing falls. And two, you, you must have weak bones, and that's the osteoporosis figure we're going to talk about. Anybody knows what's the name for, for the fractures that, that somebody sustains when they have weak bones? Where, where any orders? The osteoporotic type fractures. We, we talk about brittle bones, you may have heard about it. Um, that means your, your bones are unlikely to sustain or, or, or absorb the energy uh, impact on, on falling. When you fall, they don't bend like the younger patient. They actually break. So those are brittle, brittle bones. And where would you sustain those fractures? Well, there are four areas. One is your spine, and we'll talk about that in a second. The second most common is the wrist. That's called the collies fractures. Third is the humerus, and fourth is the hip. Think about this. Your older patient, older person, you, you try to fall. You have the ability to put out your hand to break the fall, but you break your wrist instead. As you get older and your ability to protect yourself gets less, you fall, but you can't even put out your hand. You fall on your shoulder. Fall on your shoulder. So you sustain a fracture here. Worse than that, as you get older again and your ability to protect yourself decreases further, you can't even put your shoulder, you fall wrap on your hip and your hip breaks. So, these fractures are really a continuum of a, of a deteriorating, st deteriorating state of health and one's ability to protect oneself. There's one fracture that I haven't mentioned, the spine. How, how do you sustain that fracture? Well, it doesn't come from a fall, generally speaking. It's an insidious onset, and we know it. How do we know it? Because we see patients walking around with it. 
as, as a young person, you're, you're as a young person, you stand erect and you're walking around. As you get older, you tend to bend forward. And we see the older patient almost looking at the ground. And why? I say, well, stand erect. They can't stand erect because their vertebra in the spine has collapsed. The front has wedged down. And they are looking like this. And anybody who is in the golden years of age who is bent forward has an osteoporotic fracture of their spine. Okay, and we make jokes sometimes, call them bossy back and so forth, but that is a fracture. You have osteoporosis, so without even testing, we 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 we, we can tell. Hmm. I, I mentioned already what osteoporosis is, and that is the the weakening of the bone, the brittleness of the bone. But there's another term that that comes up and, and, and confused a little bit, and that's osteoarthritis. Now, we're not here to talk about osteoarthritis. We're talking about osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is the bone being weak. Osteoarthritis is the cartilage deteriorating around the bone. Two different conditions, treated differently, different symptoms. Osteoarthritis does not cause fractures. Osteoporosis does. Osteoarthritis is treated by replacing the joint. Osteoporosis is not. Okay, so those are two terms I'd like you to, 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 to take home. So, so who gets osteoporosis? We've been classically told it's the elderly, female, fair-skinned person. But in Trinidad, I can tell you that osteoporosis is prevalent even in the dark-skinned people. It is certainly more common in fair skin, lighter weight females. But we have it so the skin color is not going to protect you from osteoporosis. I mentioned before that how do you know if you have osteoporosis? Well, if you're bent forward, you have osteoporosis. If you have sustained one of those fragility fractures, wrist fracture, shoulder, or hip fracture, you have osteoporosis. But osteoporosis is very similar to diabetes and hypertension. How do you know if you have diabetes or hypertension? You know, people will say, I have a headache, so my pressure is high. You know, I used to hear that if you, if you, if you pass urine and ants follow the urine, you have diabetes. I think all those things are old wives' tales. You have to test for it. Without testing for your diabetes or high blood pressure, you do not know if you have it. Osteoporosis is, all, is the same in that manner. There's a test for it. It's a DEXA scan, and it will give you a figure, a number, which will tell you what your bone mineral density is for your age, right? And for, and, and for a, a, a person younger than you across the normal population. You get two scores, a T and a Z score. So you will know how you compare to somebody of your own age as well as compare to another person who is about 30 years of age. And those are important figures to know, almost as important as your, as your blood pressure and, and, and your blood glucose levels. How do you treat osteoporosis? Well, I, I'm, I'm not here to, to tell you the whole gambit of treatment, simple treatment. Well, calcium, vitamin D, it's not enough to be in the sunlight. We think we're in the Caribbean, you get a lot of sun. Most of us are well covered here. So even if you're going to the sunlight, you're not gonna get enough. So supplementation with calcium, vitamin D, the older patient just doesn't eat enough. You need, you need to be sub supplemented. Um, there's also exercise. As Dr. Henry was saying, you need to exercise for your heart. But you also need to exercise for your bones and your muscle. The type of exercise, generally, weight-bearing exercise. Swimming, not, 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 not so good. Cycling, not so good. Walking, fantastic. Going to the gym, fantastic. You know, all those things are going to maintain your muscle, build your muscle mass. And the last thing, of course, um, is bisphosphonates. And, and similarly to what um, was said earlier about statins, I've heard the whole gambit about bisphosphonates. It's going to cause this, it's going to cause that. Well, one thing for sure, bisphosphonates are likely to decrease the rate at which you're losing bone and possibly prevent you from having a fracture, which could save your life. So bisphosphonates and statins have a, have a similarity. Why do elderly people fall? There are four factors put forward, biological risk factors, 
behavioral risk factors, environmental, and socioeconomic. So we're going to talk about some biological risk factors. And there are three things. One is age, gender, and race. And these are non-modifiable. We cannot change our age, our gender, or our race. That's what we've been given. It's, it's out of our control. So, so if I, so I sit to say that your gender, female genders, have a higher risk of falling compared with men. Your race, we know that the, the Caucasians fall more often than, for example, the Chinese. Why? We're not quite sure. That, the, the, but that, that, that is a fact. What about some modifiable risk factors? Well, physical strength. The stronger you are, the more likely you are to resist a fall. That seems sensible. And, 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 and what, what, about, what about things that you can do to, to help you? Well, Dr. Henry spoke about that walk here. I have to walk again, 30 to 45 minutes. And, and, and I'm talking also about another type of exercise which might be not familiar to you. It's called Tai Chi. And Tai Chi is about balance. We have aquatic therapy, balance training, gait training in the water. Extremely important. As you get older, you lose the ability to maintain your space. You tend to fall. If you don't work on balance, as you would work on your muscles, you know, this causes you to fall. So balance training is, is, is important. People who have a lower chance of falling tend to be voracious readers. They're not in their house quietly in a corner. They're reading a book rather than watching TV. And they're socially active. So by extension, top members would probably have a lower risk of falling than the general population. Here you are all gathered together with a common goal. You know, you're interested in your health. So those are things that exist. Those are biological factors. What about behavioral things? What can you do that will cause you to fall? Well, I have here alcohol abuse. We tend to associate alcohol with the younger patient, but the older patient can, can abuse alcohol, particularly the men, you know, in, my, in, my, in my, my experience. But what is more common, really, is polypharmacy, using many drugs all at the same time. I, I've commonly asked patients to show me what, what they're taking, and when they open their, their bags, the women, they would have the same drug, three different names, and they're taking all three. Uh, and, and added to that is, 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 is the fake news, the, the herbal therapies outside there, which could cure cancer, cure diabetes, cure hypertension. That combination can be, can be problematic, you know? So, so using those things are likely to, to lead you to, to some problems. I have two behavioral risk factors which I think are specific to, to our people. One is the use of stepladders. Why does the older patient go up on a stepladder? I don't know. There is no need to go on a stepladder. That is responsible for more falls than you could imagine. Stepladders are for a younger person. And the other one happens right now. In mango season, you tend to want to pick the mango. Leave those mangoes for the neighbor. Let them pick it and bring it for you. The minute you look up to pick the mango, you overbalance, you fall, that's going to be a problem. So picking the mangoes, picking the zabaka, I think those need to be, to, to be left out. Environmental risk factors, your environment. Probably one of the most dangerous environments is actually your house. And that should be one of your safest environments. Why is the house so dangerous? The things you have in your house, all the patients, Older people tend to keep a lot of things cluttered around the house. One of them is, I think, like this, carpets and mats. You always have one somewhere. They develop little rocks in it, and you trip over the rock, and you fall. So my suggestion is to get rid of all of those things. That is a disaster waiting to happen. What about the bathroom? The bathroom floor is always clean and shiny, and, it, and it's, you're likely to slip inside of there. So the bathroom needs to be equipped with anti-slip flooring. In the shower, you need to have grab rails. 
because these things can prevent you from falling, and if you're going to fall, it can prevent you from hit hitting the ground. So bathroom is one. And what about lighting? The dimmest lights tend to be present in, in the houses. You need proper lighting. Your eyesight is failing. There's no, there's no need to have a dim light. Put the 100 watt on. You need to see what's going on. Those lampshades are only casting shadows. If you see properly in the house, you're unlikely to fall. And my personal favorite is pets. In England, the, 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 the pet or the animal responsible for most falls in the elderly patient was a pigeon. You want to feed the pigeons. As you throw something to feed the pigeons, everybody goes up in the air. You, you fall back, and that is the end of that. In Trinidad, one of the most deadly animals really is your dog. You know, they're all on the ground. They're all on your feet with a leash. They trap you up off your fall. So I'm not suggesting you get rid of the dog. I'm suggesting you be careful with the dog. The dog is going to trip you up. Um, last, really, are the socioeconomic risk factors that predispose to falls. And when I say this, I mean that people in a lower socioeconomic class have less access to healthcare. They are socially isolated. You know? They do not have the economic means, despite CDAP sometimes, to access the, 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 the care that they, they need. That is a vicious cycle. And that, that is a very common cause of patients feeling neglected, um, abandoned, and, and falling. And, and I have, again, experienced that when patients fall and they break their hip, finding family members is hard. So they, 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 are, they are isolated. So trying to, that, that, that group is, is, is a special group in, in society for us. Last but not least, really, I've spoken about trying to prevent falls, I've spoken about osteoporosis. Falls osteoporosis equals a fracture. I'm going to speak about the hip fracture. As you get older, falls increase, fractures increase, hip fractures increase. Twice as many females break their hips as males. But if a male falls, he's more likely to die if he fractures his hip. Hip fractures are more common in fair-skinned people than dark-skinned people, but we are not exempt. 80 years old is a threshold. As you reach 80, your mortality from a hip fracture increases. So this is a serious problem. What, what exactly is, is the mortality I'm talking about? What, what, what is the risk of dying? So you're unlikely to die from the fracture itself. But in the year following a fracture, in 12 months following a fracture, about 30% of people will die. So that is 3 in 10 of, of the patients who sustain a fracture are going to demise in 12 months. That's a significant amount of patients who are going to die. And I can tell you that very few of them will ever get back the ability to walk normally after that. And the reason to avoid a fracture, if I haven't convinced you, one is pain. They are bloody painful. Um, you can't move, you're, you're, you're in a mess, so they're extremely painful. Two, they're also costly. You know? They're costly not only in dollars and cents, but, 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 but they're costly also in a social sense to us. You know? If you sustain a fracture, you're going to need care. And that care is going to have to come from family members who are going to have to take time off from work, maybe employ other people. So it's an expensive little thing to society to, to, to sustain a hip fracture. Three, the ability to walk again. We have a little saying that if you break your hip and you weren't using anything to walk, you're going to use a walking stick. If you break your hip using a walking stick, you're going to have a, a walker, or one of those frames to walk with. And if you happen to break your hip while you're using a walker, you're probably going to be in a wheelchair. So your ability to walk decreases over time. And last but not least, really, is the, to is the, the mortality. 30% of patients will die within 12 months of sustaining a hip fracture. There are two types 
of operations for hip fractures. One is you will replace the hip and you throw away the head because the blood supply is affected. And the second one is when you fix the hip. That is of importance really to the surgeon, not so much to the patient. Both of them have very similar outcomes either way. They're both going to lead to a decreasing ability of you to walk around, enjoy life. So my parting advice, prevent falling. Do what you can. Exercise more, check your bone density, have treatment. Osteoporosis is a real problem. It is like diabetes and hypertension. It needs to be assessed. But most of all, go out there, enjoy life. You've reached the age where Life is to be enjoyed. There's probably more behind than in front, as they say. So you need to enjoy life. You need to enjoy it in a safe environment. So exercise, exercise, exercise. That, that, that is my advice. Thank you very much. Is there any particular reason that women tend to fall more than men? Um, that, that is just some statistics that we get globally, that women fall more, 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 than, more than men. Why women break their hips or their bones more than men has to do really with their bone density and their ability to prevent themselves or protect themselves from falling. You know? But um, I, I don't know exactly why. Yes, again, you know, I'm interested about cramps about the body. Fingers cramping up. You know, you, at mornings when you get up and you want to stretch out, you just wake up. Uh, your leg is cramping and things like that and uh, can you uh, enlighten us on the causes? Right. The, the, the question is, is cramps, um, there are the two types of cramps really. One is the one that they talk about when you lose your electrolytes, so runners and so forth. Um, athletes, they, they have electrolyte imbalances. The cramps that we more commonly sustain rarely occurs when you do too much exercise and, you, and your muscle is unaccustomed to it, right? Or, 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 or two, when you, you have not done exercise at all and you're in an awkward position. So when you wake up in the morning and, 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 you, and you, you feel a cramp, it's because the position that your leg or your arm was in was awkward. And as you try to move off, the muscle reflexively con contracts. And that, that's the kind of cramp you're, you're, you're experiencing. Um, and that is simply treated by stretching the muscle more or less. You, 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 you can't prevent it as far as, as I'm aware. So none of these drugs um, that people um, recommend is, is, is helpful um, for, for those sort of things. It's a matter of stretching all the muscle in the mornings. Uh, two quick ones relating to why is it men, you say, die more often? And why within a year after they fall, someone is likely to die? Okay, good, good questions. Well. I, 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 do, I don't know exactly why men have a higher mortality rate. Th this, th these are just statistical um, studies. They, they've looked at patients who have fallen, male and female, who've sustained a hip fracture. And men have a higher rate of mortality. I I'll tell you why, why they die. What I, what I forgot to say in my presentation is that as you get older, your medical comorbidities increase. When I say that, you're more likely to have diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, kidney disease. So the fracture does not kill you. Actually, the fracture is a sign that generally your body is deteriorating. So when you fall and your ability to move further decreases, those medical comorbidities get worse. So you, you die from things like a pneumonia, a deep vein thrombosis, a stroke, um, and that's why I die within that year. You, uh, so, so, so my last point was that you have to keep moving. The minute you fall and break anything and you stay still, bad things happen. Um, so move, move, move really is, 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 is a mantra in, in that sense. Exercise is a good thing. And, and I, I think walking really is, is probably the best exercise, but it doesn't do anything for your up, upper limbs. So weight, weight training is, 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 is also an important part because as you train your muscles, the, the, your, your bones also are stimulated. Um, so I, I suggest that you, you weight train, 
um, Tai Chi and, and walking to be the important exercises. Well, thank you very much, everybody. You've been a great audience. Thanks again, Dr. Menzia. And I particularly take note of his point of exercise, 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 people just exercise. And our next speaker, Ms. G Gian Ali, is a professional optometrist with, with four years working experience in primary health care. She's a graduate of, of the great school of UWI with a BSc in honors in optometry. She offers exp expertise in refraction, refractions and is a contact lens practitioner. So. Hi, good afternoon everyone. All protocols observed. So before we start, I would like to try a little experiment. So what I would like you all to do for me is pull out your little brochures or pamphlets from optometrists today. If you don't have any, feel free to visit our booth. But for now, any brochure or pamphlet you collected today will do fine, OK? So pull it out from your bags, your handbags, wherever you collected it from. OK, so what I want you all to do for me now uh, is hold that brochure or pamphlet about half an arm's length away. And I want you to see if you can see any of that fine print on that pamphlet. Half an arm's length away, not a full arm's length. <laughs> now, I'm sure some of you all are seeing a little bit blurry. Some of you all probably seeing fine. So what I want you to do now is take that brochure and push it all the way back, a full arm's length away. Is that any clearer for some of you all? Now, you're probably wondering what exactly is going on here. Why is it when I push that further away, it's a bit clearer, but when I bring it up a bit closer, it's blurry? Well, that is what we call press biopia. Now, you're probably wondering what on earth is press biopia. But before I get into that, let me just explain how the eye works. So basically, light usually enters through the front of the eye, known as the cornea, passes through the lens inside the eye, and is able to be focused onto the back of the eye. And that is what gives us our sharp, clear vision. Now, back to that word press biopia. What happens is that when we're very young, that lens inside the eye is very elastic. So if you think of a rubber band, it's able to be stretched and pulled. So similarly, that lens inside the eye can be adjusted to help us focus on near things as well as far things. As we get a little bit older or younger, as the sign says, usually from about 40 onwards, that lens loses its elasticity. And as a result of that, we are not able to focus on near objects. So that's when you find yourself having to use a pair of reading glasses, bifocals, progressive, different type of lenses. So when it is you come in for an eye exam, what we'll do a simple series of tests to help assess your vision, as well as we monitor the health of the eyes. And from there, we'll prescribe a pair of spectacles to help you see a bit better. Now, I'm sure some people are probably thinking, well, I can see the TV clearly, I can see the papers clearly, really not necessary to test my eyes. So instead of coming to check us out, you walk straight out past our store in Grand Bazaar or West Mall and head straight to the food court. You buy yourself, whether it be some ice cream or a chiller, enjoy yourself. Now, on your way back home, you're stuck in traffic, because it's Trinidad, you have a little bit of traffic, and you find yourself looking around, everything seems a bit blurry. Now, why is everything blurry all of a sudden? You manage to make it home, then you take a little nap for two hours, then you get back up and everything is clear. Now you sit down trying to figure out what exactly went on there. Why is it that two hours ago my vision was a bit blurry and now all of a sudden it's clear? Well, what happens is that when you're diabetic as well as pre-diabetic, when you have something that causes your sugar to rise, it actually causes fluid inside the eyes to enter the tissues inside the eyes causing that tissue to swell, and that is what causes your blurry vision. Now, when your sugar returns to normal after a few hours, what happens is that that fluid exits the tissues in the eye, and that is why you're able to see clear again. Now, in some instances, I know not everyone checks their sugar every day, because let's face it, who likes poking yourself with a needle every day? So some people, their sugar may be high for a long period of time not knowing that. When this happens and the sugar remains high, tiny little blood vessels towards the back of the eye becomes blocked and causes fluid to leak. Also, what happens is that it causes bleeding towards the back of the eye. And we call this diabetic retinopathy. 
As this bleeding becomes more severe, it can actually lead to scarring, which can actually cause permanent loss of vision. So this is why we would strongly encourage you, if you know you're pre-diabetic, diabetic, or even if you're not sure, come in for an annual eye exam, because we don't want to wait until you start losing your vision before we do something about it. Because in most times, when you start to lose a vision, sometimes you may not be able to get back that vision you have lost. So coming in for an annual eye exam helps us to monitor any early changes towards the back of the eye, so as to prevent that vision loss. Now let's talk about something called cataract. So I'm sure you're wondering, what exactly is cataract? So if you think about a car, when you now get this new car, those headlights towards the front are very clear. Once you put on those lights, they are nice and bright. Everything seems fine. A few years down the road, that headlight becomes a bit foggy or hazy, dirty looking. You try wiping it a few times, nothing seems to help. Once you put on those headlights again, it's just not as bright as it used to be when you now got that car. The lens in the eye is a little bit similar in that when you're very young, that lens inside the eye is very clear. As it gets a bit older, typically from 50 onwards, proteins inside that lens actually clumps together, causing the lens in the eye to become a bit cloudy. And that is why you start to notice your vision becoming a bit blurry, or some people might say not as bright as it used to be, or very dim. And again, this is why during an eye exam, we are able to pick up any early changes in the lens inside the eye. And from there, we are able to prescribe a pair of spectacles to help you see a bit sharper and clearer. Because as that lens becomes more and more cloudy, it actually changes your spectacle prescription. Now, it may reach a point where even a pair of spectacles, you're still not seeing very clearly, and you start to realize, I can't read the papers, I can't see to do my gardening. It starts to affect your everyday activities. When this is the case, what we'll do is refer you for a simple procedure. It's usually about 10 to 15 minutes. What they do is they remove that cloudy lens or the cataract inside the eye, and they actually put on a clear artificial lens and you're able to see clear again. Now, I'm trying to keep this a little short since I know we are uh, trying to short for time. So finally, I would like to mention glaucoma. Now, I'm sure you've heard the word glaucoma, whether it be from a family member, or you read about it somewhere, or you heard somebody talk about it on television. But what exactly is glaucoma? Glaucoma is usually associated with raised pressures in the eye, and as a result of that, it can actually cause damage towards the nerve at the back of the eye. Now, it's also known as a silent thief of sight because there are usually no symptoms in glaucoma. One of the first symptoms is that you start to lose your peripheral or side vision. However, by the time you start to notice this, it's in a far long stage. It's in one of the last stages. So you eventually get what we call tunnel vision. So by this time, most people start bumping into things, walking into chairs, tables, and then it's only then they decide to come in for an eye test. But again, don't wait for it to reach late stages to come in. Because once again, once it reaches this stage, unfortunately, it's not something we can reverse and get back your vision. Once that vision is lost, it's gone. So what happens is, if left untreated, it can eventually lead to blindness. So all these things, glaucoma, cataract, diabetes, all these are actually very common causes of blindness, especially in the Caribbean, because we wait too long to go see about it. All these are also preventable from, all these are also preventable. So don't wait until you start losing your vision to come in. Once you come in for annual eye, che eye checks, we are able to monitor any early changes and be able to treat and diagnose any problems before you start losing your vision. Just keep in mind that you are given one pair of eyes in your lifetime, and you can't get it back, you can't get new ones or anything like that. So take care of the eyes you were given. Come in for annual eye checks so you won't go blind or start losing your sight. Okay? Thank you. Uh, what about when you see, I think you call them floaters, this spots. what? Pre what causes and what can one do to prevent? 
So you can't necessarily prevent the floaters. What happens is that in the eye, there is a gel-like substance we call the vitreous. And sometimes tissues or other complications from diabetes can actually cause floaters. So it looks like little black spots floating around or simple treads. So anytime you notice a sudden onset of these floaters, it's always good to come have an eye exam for us to determine what exactly caused it. But as in to prevent it, you can't prevent the floaters. Sometimes they just look cool. Good afternoon, everyone. Good I'm afternoon. smiling because I'm not standing to boast about what I'm going to say. My mother is 93. She has never had an eye test. She can see the smallest speck on the floor. Should I base my mindset on her and tell myself that I will be like her? <laughs> <laughs> but I would agree with you that we should all take the annual eye test. But I yeah. just felt I should talk about my mother who's 93. I guess it's the almighty. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, that is great to hear, but again, it's still good just to come check the health, make sure everything is good. Better to be safe than sorry. Why is it at this age, when we get older, we tend to feel as if we are falling on the side? You know, like we see shadows, what causes that? And you find a lot of elderly will always tell you, you know, they feel off balance. You know, so there's a shadow that seems to pass them. Is that a medical problem? Um, feeling off balance, sometimes it could be, well, with the type of spectacles you're wearing. I know some people say they feel off balance with the bifocals or progressives. Uh, to say offhand what exactly is causing that is a bit difficult because sometimes it could be a number of things. So again, the best thing is coming when we can actually see what's going on inside the eyes, then we would be able to give you a more accurate answer. Thank you, Ms. Ali. The, the, the alerts are out there. The warnings are there. Come in and check your eyes. We told about exercise. We, told about, we heard about smoking. We heard about watching the fats. And the alerts are there, particularly at this stage of our lives. We move on quickly. And this is, a, this is a, I think, that's going to touch all of us. We start speaking about money. We all, as Max and others say, we need the money. So we want, I want to bring on Ms. Arlene Stevens, who is, who is the head of corporate communications and education at the Trinidad and Tobago Securities and Exchange Commission. Stocks and bonds. Good afternoon, everyone. Everyone hearing me? OK. So first of all, I have to give my disclaimer. Because we are the Trinidad and Tobago Securities and Exchange Commission, and we are the regulator of the securities industry, we will not tell you where to invest your money or who to invest your money with. What we try to do is to provide you with the tools that you need in order for you to make an informed choice. I really want to thank TARP for this fantastic session that they've put on here today. I think it is very, very important and very, very relevant, and I'm glad to see all of the numbers out. So what I'm going to talk about is it's investor education, it's financial literacy, it's financial education. How many of you in here feel that you are empowered and you understand all about finances, you have made your budget, you have your financial goals, and you're well on the way to achieving success in that regard. Show of hands. Okay. So not all of us. We ask a question when we do invest education. And we have a booth, and we have a spin the wheel, and we've been asking the question all day. When do you start to plan for retirement? Anybody? 60, 50, you would not believe that when we asked the question today, somebody told me 60. By then it's too late, yeah? 
we say in our investor education that you start to prepare for retirement from the first day that you start to work. And I explained to a gentleman this morning about this thing called compound interest. You all know about that? The earlier you start to save, the more your money will grow. And a lot of people do not understand that. One of the things that we also try to do is to try and get ministries and companies to bring us in to do investor education when persons are now joining the organization. But guess what? A lot of ministries call us two years before somebody's about to retire. What can we do to help them then? So I just have a few simple steps for persons planning on retirement. You need to determine when you want to retire. Some people retire at 60, some people retire at 65, some people plan to retire at 55. If you know when you intend to retire, you also need to take good care of your physical health because you would recognize that a lot of us are living longer. If you are living longer, some of the issues that were discussed earlier will be facing you. How do you intend to finance those issues if you have not planned? How many of you are satisfied with the income that you currently have? It meets all of your needs and you don't need any extra by a show of hands. Nobody? One, two, a few. How many people feel that when they retire and they're receiving less income than they're receiving now, they will be able to handle all of the issues that they need to? A lot of people cannot manage the, on the money that they're making now, and we remind them that when they are about to retire, their income is going to be less. So what you need to do is plan for that eventuality. So we have a few tips, and we have a handout that we have at our booth that you can get. We always encourage persons to grow a nest egg. You need to keep good records. You need to set your savings goals and your retirement goals. You need to review things like your insurance coverage and your insurance policies as you get older because that coverage will change. You need to try and eliminate and reduce all of your consumer debt. How many of us know persons who are about to retire but they still have a mortgage or they still have huge credit card debt? When you're about to retire, you should be free of that type of debt. And what you do is plan so that by the time you retire, those payments are over. Do we have any persons in here who are entrepreneurs? We learned a new term recently. It's called senior entrepreneurship. It really speaks to you using skills that you have in order to earn an additional income when you retire. Do we have any bakers in here? Hairdressers? Mechanics? Anybody who can cook? These are skills that you can use in your senior years, in your golden years, to add additional income. One of the things that we also talk about is using equity in your homes. Some people are able to convert a part of their home into a rental income for themselves. All of these things are designed so that you are not as dependent as you could be on the state for your pension or your children and grandchildren to take care of you. One of the most critical things though for seniors we need to stress is financial fraud. A lot of people target seniors simply because they know at this stage in their lives, they already have gotten their pension, they may have gotten some back pay along the, along the way, 
So seniors have money. And therefore, you find that there are people who will target them. So we want to tell you to be very aware of financial scams. Anytime someone comes and tells you something that sounds too good to be true, it usually is too good to be true. If an investment guarantees a return, we always say there's no such thing as a guaranteed return. So once they say it is guaranteed, you need to be a little cautious. You also need to be very careful of investments that encourage you to bring in other people. We talk about something called a Ponzi or a pyramid scheme. It's where a promoter comes in and they get, let's say, 20 people to come into the scheme, but the 20 people have to get 40 people to come into the scheme and then the 40 people get 80 people to come into the scheme. The money from the 80 people is what pays the 40. The money from the 40 pays the 20. But what happens when the 80 people don't get 160 people? What we say is the pyramid starts to totter. And when the pyramid starts to totter, the promoter takes the money and runs. So you need to educate yourself about finance. It is never too late to start. The earlier you start is always the better. But once you equip yourselves with the tools that you need to make wise financial choices, you will be better off for it. Feel free to visit our booth, visit our website to get additional information. Thank you very much. The recently, uh made available the NIF fund. Is that a guaranteed fund? As far as I'm aware, it's not guaranteed. So we should not have put our money then then? No, the thing about investments is all investments carry some level of risk. You will determine the level of risk based on what the fund is invested in. So for instance, if, you, if there's a company that has been around forever, you look at their market trends, you see how they have performed, you will make your decision based on that fact. If I just come up and I say, I have a fund and I want you to invest with me because I think I'm pretty, or I tell you, I've been in the business for years, but I can't prove that to you, and you choose to invest with me, that's a risk that you're taking. So any investment will have a risk there is no such thing as a guarantee, but you can hedge your risk based on how well the particular company has been performing. So would you say, if I put my 5,000 in with the NIF fund now, mm -hmm. and I put it in for the next five years, I did a good thing? You're trying to get me to say something that I'm not allowed to say. I'm sorry, ma'am, but you see, but, we are all retirees with a fixed okay. income, and so, we don't have money. But let me tell you from our point, we are lay people with penny pocket, so we have to understand where right. we are. So let me answer it this way. Mm -hmm. There are different types of securities in which you can invest your money. Bonds tend to be one of the safer types of securities in which you can invest your money. Stocks or equity is um, an investment opportunity that can have high returns, but with high returns come high risk. With a bond, you have moderate returns that are generally secure. Also with a bond, if you have a government bond, even if the government were to change, the new government would be honoring the bond. I think that's the best way I can tell you as to how good or not good your I, investment is. I'm not is. going to put you on the spot because I really wanted to go even deeper into that, you know, because members call and ask, and we have to give them some sort of advice. We, we are not financial people. But in my simple... Mm -hmm. My simple penny pocket, 10, 20, 20 dollars, I don't know anything else more than that. I said, well, if you're putting in $5,000 and you're getting 4.5% for the five years, hello, five years from now, that $5 is worth $5.
$5,000. So and remember, what are you doing it for? Remember, the banks are offering you what? Zero points. Yes, but even so, um, don't, let's not get technical because, because in, again, in my simple mind, if the bank is giving me 0.25%, even in the next five years per year, you know, I might reach up because the value of my dollar is going to be more than, you know, selling it now. I mean, taking it now and waiting five years from now when my $5,000 will really worth 3000 But I want to thank you, and I don't want to put you on a spot. I just want to tell you the way I think and the way the members think, you know, is penny dollars we have in our pocket. Um, but we just want to make a little money, and we want to know we did it wisely. Now, let me, let me add one more thing. One of the securities that we regulate is called mutual funds. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who are not quite willing to enter the stock market and play that, you know, determine whether to buy or sell and that kind of thing, you may find that they will put their money in mutual funds. A mutual fund is a collection of persons' money where a fund manager will look at stocks, bonds and cash they take your money and they invest it in those instruments but they do a mix so that let's take your same five thousand dollars they may put three thousand dollars in equity because they chance to get a higher return they may put a thousand in bonds and a thousand in cash if the equity doesn't do so well, and the bond, which is a moderate fund, does well, it kind of balances out. So some people opt to put their money in mutual funds and let the fund manager worry about the risk. But at the end of the day, because you have diversified your portfolio and not put all of your eggs in one basket, you have a better chance of coming out ahead of the game. I understand all that you're saying. I'm just playing the devil's advocate That's because okay. these, are the, these are the thing members ask. That's fine. Because they don't understand all this equity and, and balance and everything else. All they want to do, my government tell me that if I put $5,000 in, I'm making 4.5. Hello, the bank giving me 0.25. I go in, I support my government. Right. Other than that, I take in SUSU plan you know, are joining us, Susu. Right. But I thank you. I just wanted them to understand from the layman point of view, you know, if, I mean, they would have already done it, yeah. you know? But they are so we just, coming. yeah. So we just sit and wait and your 5,000 you will get in five years time is just from my point is what is the value of my 5,000 five years from now. I thank you. One of the other things I want to add for the audience is that we do investor education sessions where we come to your organization and we would provide information. Remember, not where to put your money or what to put your money in, but we would provide information to explain all of these things that I'm explaining to you. So you can feel free to go to the booth. There's a sign-up sheet, and you can have us come to your particular group, and we do a, uh, a session. It's free of charge, and we will go any day of the week up until Saturday. I don't do Sundays. Yeah, afternoon again. Yes. A question, you said there had no guarantee. You made a statement about that. But if, since you are the S so you have Security Exchange Commission, it means if an organization says, invest with us, we guarantee you 4%. What happens? You say there's no guarantee. So how can that statement be taken? The only way and what can we do? The only way that they can guarantee you 4% is if they put your money in something that can earn more than 4%. Well, that so, is their problem. So, eh? so what they do is it's a market employee where they will say 4%. They are hoping to make 7%. And if they make 7%, then they could give you 4% because they have that 3% for themselves. So it's a marketing gimmick when somebody says something is guaranteed because remember an economy and finance, it's cyclical. Things fluctuate, they go up and down. 
So the only way they will give you, they will tell you a guarantee of 4% is if they're putting money in something that we, they expect to give you a return of 7%. Okay, that is their risk. But if, you, if we sign something where you say, you guarantee that you will give me 4%, what recourse do I have okay. with them? Once the, once the um, person is registered with the commission, you can lodge a complaint with the commission. If they are not registered with the commission and they have not fulfilled the promise that they gave you, you can still lodge a complaint with the commission and we could investigate and take action once there's a breach of the Securities Act. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Arlene. Thank you very much. They got to, as I said, we've got to watch the money. They watch the money. Ladies and gentlemen, we come to the end of this, but we'd less like to, to see where is Mr. Francis. Mr. Francis Raymond, the, the, the honorary treasurer. We'd just like to say a few words of thanks to all of the participants. Some of them have left, but also thanks to you all for staying the course. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, as they say, the longer you live, the more you learn. Having been involved in the health insurance industry for the past 28 years, it was really uh, an experience listening to Dr. Henry, Dr. Mencia, Mrs. Jivan Ali from the health sector and from to Ali in the financial sector. And as your honorary treasurer, it was a learning experience. Thank you, Ms. Aline. To all of you who stayed back to the end, we'd really like to thank all of you for participating in this venture and to, to the persons who contributed, Dr. Mencia, Dr. Henry, Arlene, Ms. Ali. Thank you once again. <laughs> and like we say, now don't forget that we'll be open tomorrow too from 10 in the morning to 5. Looking forward to seeing all of you. Thanks again for being part, and see you tomorrow. God bless you all. Thanks again, ladies and gentlemen. You've been a great audience, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.